1968, I turned 18. Boy, I knew everything, and uh, it was it was quite quite a year. And I remember uh, I lived in Chicago, from Chicago, and so in 1968, all sorts of things were happening. Cities were burning, all kinds of stuff was going on, and I remember sitting watching television one night with my mom, and uh, you know the. Uh, 1968 Democratic National Convention was going on downtown. And um, I said to my mom, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to go downtown. She says, yeah, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Whole lots of things were happening in that time. And with a great deal of hindsight that is blessed by wisdom, over many years, we have come to see that 1968 was not such a great year after all. It was filled with a lot of change and filled with a lot of things that went on, but it was the first time, really, that there was a wholesale walking away from the teachings of the church and a wholesale defiance of the Pope. Defiance. Now, that really hasn't gone away. I mean, there's still folks all over the place who claim to be good Catholics who could give a rip about what the Pope thinks or says or whatever. That has to change too much. But that's where it started. That's where it started. And it started with the most insidious of all kinds of situations, but most especially the defiance over the Pope's teaching on human life, the encyclical called Humana Vitae. It was from there that traditional Catholic teaching was turned upside down. Traditional moral teaching was turned inside out. And the dignity of the human race was somehow slipped away in the time in which it took for priests, religious, men and women within the church, everyone just decided that children were not important. Children were not a gift given to loving and committed parents. That men and women did not need to be committed to each other, to be wildly and passionately driven to each other. Women somehow became lost in, in the shuffle. And true dignity and purpose and beauty of women was lost. Men did not feel in any way a compunction to care for, respect women. So many things have been lost in the years intervening from 1968 to the present. All of these things were predicted by Pope Paul VI. All of these things were prophetic utterances of the Vicar of Christ on earth. And all of them have been pushed aside over the years, trounced upon by secularism, and by a sense of understanding the fact that we are in control of our own lives and therefore we make the rules. And this is a sad situation because it has produced an abundance of lack of love for humanity 
from the very earliest days of human life. A sense of understanding that abortion is okay is an almost unheard of kind of thing until our time. Abortion has become a sense of birth control. When all else fails and our instincts drive us to such a way and to such a to such a frenzy that human life is created, we still believe that our needs, our pleasure, our ways of behaving triumph over God's plan to create a human life. And we continue to abort babies. Millions since 1968. It is finally starting to dawn upon every one of us that this is a real situation and a real problem. And we are starting to see a bit of some of this turning over, turning back. But unfortunately, it's not doing everything that it needs to do in order to stem the tide of the prophecy of soon to be beatified Pope Paul VI. Because we have lost a sense of the beauty and the integrity of a committed relationship between a man and a woman. That has been lost. And it's going to take a long time to bring that back. We have lost the sense of the awe in which men should behold women. We have lost the sense of the absolute dignity and beauty of women beyond just what we see and what they can razzle-dazzle us with, but the integrity, the beauty, the inner strength of women. Somehow that's not respected anymore. Part of it is the fact that they themselves have tossed it aside in a sense of understanding that they are equal with men. I still would like to see one man give birth to a child. They are not equal. Women hold it all. And it is their beauty that has been lost. It is their sense of, of, of true integrity that has been profaned through lies and distortions. They have been fed a steady diet of the fact that if they really want to be liberated and free, they must make chemicals a part of their bodies and thus alter what goes on naturally and beautifully according to God's plan. Men look at women strangely Men see women as objects. The whole sense of who we are and how we live and how we are called to be, all of these things predicted, all of these things referred to strongly and beautifully in the encyclical of 1968, Humanae Vitae, have all come true. And we've prayed, we've marched, we've held rallies, we've gone the, the full measure of what we can do to help people to understand 
that we are not God, but we have minds and we have brains and we are using them for every single thing imaginable when it comes to uh, the, the medical, the technological, and all of the various kinds of ways in which we can master the human race in a way that says, we will be God. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen because over the history we have seen various ways in which these sorts of things, these distortions of humanity, these distortions of our human reason, these, these rejections of, of the human person have led us to a very unique kind of situation in life where we have seen mass murder, we have seen genocide, we have seen the various ways in which people can treat people ruthlessly and cruelly when human life is not respected. Scripture leads us tonight to an awareness of the fact that we are wonderfully made. Scripture reminds us of the fact that God has become one with us. It's not just a matter of God choosing and sending an emissary into the world. No, Scripture reminds us tonight it is not enough that you will be my servant. You will be my light. You will be a light for the world. And thus we come to understand the beauty of the incarnation. We come to understand that our work for life is a part of God's plan. It is at the root of the most incredible miracle that God has planned. And, and a miracle that only God could think of. That God himself would become one with us in our human flesh. If there is anything that helps us to understand the significance, the beauty, the wonder, the dignity of the human race, it is the fact that God has assumed this flesh. God has become one with us. Human flesh is not just something grown in a petri dish. Human flesh is not harvested. Human flesh is not created in a moment of frenzy and passion. Human life is a gift from Almighty God, given to us by God Himself. Human beings are not accidents. Human beings are not byproducts of mischievous action. Human beings are gifts from God. We need to think about that when we enter into relationships. We need to think about that when we choose spouses, when we choose a spousal relationship. We need to think about that when we behold other people, to see them not so much as, as, as agents of our pleasure, as much as they are images of God's great generosity, creativity, genius. The one thing that we continually need to do as we fight our fight for life is to help people to understand the beauty and the wonder of creation. To help people to understand that we are here for a very short time and that we are destined for heaven. We are created with one thought in mind, to go back to God, because it is from God from whom we've come. And it is important that the more we continue to focus ourselves on the beauty and the wonder of our creation, that we will start to see the beauty and the wonder that is the spark of life in every human being. And we will respect God as we respect one another. So it's not just a matter of trying to change an aberration of society, wherein men and women are eager to kill their own children. 
But it is a matter of helping us to understand that first and foremost, we are the image of God's love. And it's not just a matter of trying to stop us from doing bad things. It is a matter of helping us to choose good things. To see the goodness of God in one another. To see the goodness of God in mutual and loving and committed relationships. To see the goodness of God in the eyes of someone who truly loves and respects a spouse. To see children as gifts instead of little vessels of entitlement. Allowing us to try to understand that the only way we are going to have kids is that we have to have an absolute way for them to live. And they have to walk right in to have absolutely everything that they want as soon as they say they want it. This is not the way in which human beings are called to live. No one of us is guaranteed anything here on this earth. We are guaranteed eternal life. What we need to work for, we need to, to open our minds and our hearts and our eyes to, is that there is a need for us to work here. God has given us a beautiful world. Somehow, we're dissatisfied. We're dissatisfied with God's world. We're dissatisfied with one another. We're dissatisfied with ourselves. The sad picture of human life is not God's plan for us. The sad assault on one another, abusive relationships, domestic violence, all the various ways in which we assail one another, this is not God's plan. begins by looking in the mirror. See and love what God has created. See and love the gift of your life. Realize that there is going to be trouble, there is going to be temptations, there is going to be problems in this world. But realize that God has overcome this world through Jesus Christ. There isn't one single problem, one single area of rejection, one single area of temptation that God has not experienced in Jesus Christ in our lives. Jesus is a part of our human life. And the more we come to understand that, the deeper we pray, the deeper we move into that mystery, the more we will come to understand the true, authentic beauty and dignity of human life, created in the image and the likeness of God, destined to live for all eternity in the kingdom that God has created, to which may God lead us all.